All right, welcome back, everyone. Today is one of the um, the very climactic, very cinematic moments in Exodus. So let's go ahead and jump in. I am curious with because uh, we're talking about the crossing of the Red Sea today. What is your all's thinking about what we read versus our, this is one of the moments where the movies do it well and uh, both the Charleston Heston version and the animated version have slightly different takes on it. But I'm curious if you all had any reflections on what we read versus what you've seen throughout the years and how this is depicted. Hmm. I never... Um realize how much uh, the figure of God uh, was making things worse. Uh, and I, my reaction, I saw the movie Golda, where Egypt uh, and Syria attack uh, Israel unprovoked, was well, not totally unprovoked, they have a bad history, but um, and Israel does whatever it can to defend itself. And they don't go a little bit too far, I think, but it's not, it wouldn't mm -hmm. that qualify as a war crime. But what, what God is doing, not only does he make it difficult for them to follow, he decides he's going to kill them too mm -hmm. and drown them all. And it's to me that's a war crime. I mean, we, we would call that a war crime now, and I think it's I, I it changes my whole feeling. And just because they want God wants everybody to know He's a really great guy, He's powerful. He does these kinds of things that I don't understand the thinking with that. I I, I don't. I mean, does do people like the idea that God is up there doing this? What can I do to really be awful? I mean, it's it's uh. Is it necessary to, in the story, to make us really worship this person, this being? I, I, I didn't realize that it, it was like that. It's I know it's cinematic, but there are people cheering when the Egypts are Egypt is the Egyptians are being. Uh, it's it's like it's like. Uh, killing somebody and then cutting their head off. You know, you know, it's it's just, I don't know. Does anybody else have a reaction like that? Uh, Mary Ellen, what, what you're thinking? Well, I'm completely in agreement with Sue that this, this was my reaction as well, that this is an extremely vengeful God, um, a God who says he's doing all these things so that um, they will know how powerful he is. And um, I'm putting this in my own words right now, but uh, glorify him because of all his power. And I don't like this God. I, I, we talked about um, things earlier on with um, the God of the Old Testament being not being the same as the God of the New Testament. We've talked about God evolving through the stories um and i i totally i mean sue i totally agree with what you're saying because that was my reaction as well i don't like this god i don't want to be worshiping this god with what his goals and purposes are i don't approve of all of this so um yeah that's my he's continue not, he's not teaching love and forgiveness and it's a very different um, picture. It's interesting that some churches, uh, more e conservative churches, focus a lot on, I think, on the Old Testament. And I I don't know what the conservative churches, some of the churches focus a lot on Old Testament passages. And mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Larry, what, what are you thinking? Well, if you look at it from the standpoint of the people who wrote the Bible. Yes. Okay. Their purpose is try to try to convince people uh, for Christianity. 
So what that was the sole purpose of what God was doing. He was not only letting the Egyptians know that he was the old all powerful God. He was letting the Israelites know and he was letting everybody else in the world know. So if you really want to try to convince the masses about uh, uh, about something, you you exaggerate <laughs> in whatever way you see fit to try to convince people to come your way, and that possibly might might been the reason. I, I don't know how anyone could justify on a humanitarian way what happened. I mean, that's that, but, well, that's yeah. not it, but... But, but that's not even what people needed at the point. They needed to know they had somebody in their corner and, and, and really would be there for them. And they had chosen Israel and would would see that Israel got what it needed but it's it it's it to me it is going up pretty much overboard yeah so Mary Ellen and then Helen I saw you like start to raise your hand so um picking up on what Larry said but this is teaching the masses and the future generations to fear God to yeah. fear what his power can do. And here he is um, um, killing thousands and thousands of people. And you know, some of them innocent, some, um, I don't know, I just, I, I, I think the whole message, if it's to um, speak to generations following and this isn't actually what happened at the time i think it's really overstated mm -hmm. and i don't like it yeah so helen what you're thinking well um i'm thinking that uh, i agree with larry in the fact that this was a story that was written by people who were trying to explain the power of god and people at that time were probably pretty wild and woolly anyway, and were willing to accept these terrible deaths. On the other hand, I'm thinking of the Egyptians themselves. They chose to go after, and they, they knew the power of God, really, because he had shown it before. They should know that that sea is going to come over them anyway. And why would they choose to to go after them. They were horrible to the Israelites while the Israelites were there. And uh, so I, I see a little bit of the people making choices and that God was there making this all happen. But on the other hand, what are, what are these choices that people have made? Yeah, Larry, then Sue. Okay. okay. But have we really changed? We dropped a great big bomb on Hiroshima and yeah. killed how many hundred thousands of people? And then twice two bombs. Yeah, that was a war crime also. Did. Then we dropped another. And the justification was to end war. The Israelites justification is God helped us so we could escape. Did did they say that God, you know, in, in uh in the Bible, it says that the Israel, I mean, the Egyptians went after the Israelites because uh, the God hardened their heart, hardened their heart, so they <laughs> they felt like they really wanted to keep going, you know, uh, going after them. It was they were well, at one point, according to this passage, they were willing to accept that they were leaving, and then they changed their mind. It was because of the God wanted to create a situation where where Yahweh could, I mean, not really Yahweh, it doesn't yeah. like Yahweh. But anyway, so it was. So minute. this goes back to a question I brought up at the very beginning of like, how much do we prescribe a free will in this story versus like yeah. God playing puppeteer? And yeah. this is kind of some of the things I hear in your all's conversation here is 
this one feels a little bit more like God is like orchestrator, God as conductor, yeah. God pulling the strings. Yeah. And we're uncomfortable if God is pulling the strings on this one with where it leads mm -hmm. us. We're more comfortable with the situation if God is just responding to humans being stubborn. But I actually want to circle back to what you said, Larry, um, about are we any better today? Oh. Because I think that's an interesting question when thinking about how we want to give the um, almost mercy to the Egyptians. And there's a few things that come to mind. And like one of the first ones is um, I remember at a very young age, uh, my mom watched, like I came in the room and my mom's watching television and it was the execution of Timothy McVeigh, someone mm. who just undoubtedly did terrible things. Um, he, the Oklahoma bombing and all of that. And my mom was sitting there watching him, um, be executed. And I remember my little kid self was horrified absolutely horrified that like the death penalty was a thing my inner sense of justice was like this is wrong but also the feeling of like it's not just that they're executing this man they are televising the execution of this man and my mom had to assure me oh no he did terrible thing he deserves to die and still to this day there's something that doesn't sit right with me of using violence against someone who was so violent and mm. like kind of that inner sense of like is this actually okay but I think about also how people talk about abusers and abusers getting their justice I know that when um Larry Nasser got or uh, was sentenced there's a lot of people who had um comments of like oh i hope he gets in prison what he did to those girls and that's that similar sense of vengeance and justice of like he did terrible things i hope terrible things happen to him and probably they did uh unless he was in solitary um, yeah um yeah yeah but yeah. one more thought to kind of like put us in the mindset of like how do we see justice today is even thinking about how we tried um people or the nazis and or well also the italians but in world war ii and thinking about like what was our sense of justice when like the i i remember recently they found out one more person was a person that was he was an old man at the time and there's this discussion of like he would have been a teenager like does he deserve to go to this um this trial because he was just following orders he was a teenager but he was in the third reich and this back and forth of like what does this man deserve and does it matter if he was just following orders does it like and there's all this muddiness that i'm not sure we're actually too far away from what we're reading in scripture but mary ellen i saw your hand creep up <laughs> it's revenge it's it's, it's, it's revenge Justice. Uh, people's reactions to Larry Nasser, um, hoping that he would get in prison what he did, that's a human um, interpretation of justice, of um, wanting vengeance back on the abuser for what he did. We're talking about God here and God having a vengeance and God retaliating mm -hmm. and um, I see it as as as, as different that I, I don't see the human and our imperfect. Um, you know, I don't see it. what we wish on on Larry Nasser equating to what God was doing to the Egyptians. I I don't know. To me, it's human versus God. And so, does it help to take a one step back? And remember that humans are writing these stories and that this view of God, even like we can talk about how much, how close this is to history, like what actually happened, what didn't happen. We find no archaeological evidence of a bunch of uh, Egyptian soldiers at the bottom of any big body of water. So 
there isn't really archaeological evidence. So that means that, I mean, but even if we did, this is people's experience of God being tunneled through human understanding. And I think yes. that can give us a little bit of distance instead of saying this is exactly what God did versus this is what the people understood that God did. And like, even if God spoke directly, it is still being processed and remembered and retold through human experience. Larry, I see you jumping in. Yeah, it, it may not be so much a matter of vengeance as it is one of rationalization and okay. trying to explain your bad behavior. I well recall uh, when they dropped those bombs on Hiro Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the people in the United States, nobody felt bad. You know, no. they, well, look at all the terrible things the Japanese did to our prisoners and, and how many thousands of people they killed and so forth. So it wasn't so much that we were going to get even. It was that, well, you know, we did something that was bad, but it was justified because of the yeah. bad things that had been done on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, was, I think it's all, it wasn't, it, it, right away, I think people were really just relieved the war was over. Mm -hmm. um, the second bomb was unnecessary, and the, and the first one, there was no warning. So, I, it 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 really is questionable. Uh, I I think that it's good that 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 it's being looked at now as a uh, maybe not the best thing to have done. Uh, no matter what the, the Japanese did, do we want to get down on their level? And uh, they really did do awful stuff. It's hard to picture the Japanese doing that now. They are such docile people. Uh, uh, Mary Ellen, what do you have a comment? Um, I'm ready to move on. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm, if everybody's in agreement, I don't know if anybody else wants to throw in comments uh, on the other. Let's give Gary a chance to say something. Just well, <laughs> before we move on on the whole sub subject of the atomic bombs, there. There's another side of the story of how many hundreds of thousands of uh, allied American troops uh, did not have to die to end the war. Yeah. So there, you know, when Truman made that decision, uh, it wasn't like he was a, a bloodthirsty individual. He was, no. a good, he was a good soul and he, and there were facts that said that that was, that was probably the right horrible thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I know we're not studying that now yeah mm -hmm. but i mean there what's interesting in all these conversations all these aspects of the conversation is it is interesting how um getting distance from the from what has happened makes us reflect in a different way um mm -hmm. i think there is a lot uh, the opinion of the dropping of those bombs is very different today than, I mean, kind of Larry, as you brought up, like no one batted an eye, like this was just seen as what had to be done. Yeah. And now there's a question or there's a lot more questioning of like, could it have been done differently? Could we have done it better? Could there have been something that would have made it less horrible? And like, there is the pros and cons. And like Gary, you were saying, like there was lives that were, I mean, it was the best of the bad decision, uh, best, worst, worst, bad. it was the option that was seen to save lives and that was a part of the equation. And so I think giving that same kind of texture to what we have in front of us today is, or we should give this, we should give that to today's scripture as well. And kind of remembering that this is being filtered through humans, but also that we are finding this abhorrent. I think that is an interesting thing that I remember when watching the movies, it was cool and like, oh, look at the crossing of the Red Sea. And when we're getting into the text, the feeling is more, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is terrible. Mm -hmm. And so let's hold it with us um, and actually start to walk through um, the text we have before us. 
So one of the cool things is I remember this from my, uh, I did take an actual class on Exodus. And one of the things my professor had us do in this story is break it apart. We haven't done this in a while because we haven't had a story quite like this since Genesis. But scholars actually think that there's two versions of the crossing story that are here stitched together fairly well. So it, it doesn't always appear. But one of the things as we walk through, I'm going to kind of point out some of where the tonal shifts are, where we think two stories have been patched together, which will give us kind of an, another angle of what's going on here. So let's jump in. So it starts with the Lord saying to Moses and giving the instructions that um, turn back and camp at this place, um, camp on the opposite side of the sea. I'm going to trick Pharaoh and make Pharaoh think you're just wandering around. You're aimless and that he can reclaim you pretty easy. You've come, come up to the edge of the wilderness and you don't know where to go. So I'm going to make you look like sitting ducks, basically. Mm -hmm. And this is where we see kind of God more plain puppeteer of like, I'm going to engineer the situation where Pharaoh thinks he can reclaim you. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah, what's up? I'm picturing this all as being basically desert area, but they mm -hmm. keep calling it the wilderness. So how are they defining wilderness here? So I have a visual image of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's actually an interesting question. I am going, um, I'm actually trying to think of a point where they use the term desert in scripture and it's not coming up with anything. So wilderness as kind of almost fairly uninhabitable land. Um, in this area, they would be aware of like the Sahara, which is like, I think one of the quintessential deserts in our mind, like huge sand dunes, small oases. They're not talking about kind of that landscape at the moment. But think of things that are like really rocky, very, like not much plant life, dried out, not in the sand dune sense, but life will be hard and you can't really set up a city because there's not a lot of uh, water sources, basically. Uninhabitable land? I Mostly uninhabitable. Let me see if I can... Uh, let me see if I can get a picture. Uh, okay. Um, let me, okay. So thank you, or thanks to Google Images. So this is what a lot of the land of Israel kind of looks like. Like you have rocky areas here. But if you have a water source, you can kind of see this green pop out of the um, out of the landscape. You can kind of see the dots of green here and the dots of green back there. But on the side, do you see how barren this area is? There's like a little bit of scrubland, but plants don't grow very tall and it's very rocky. Versus like this area that's dead, functionally inert uh you let's see is there are other places where everything is rock and gravel there's a little bit of plant life there but it's one of those if your canteen runs dry in this landscape you are going to be in trouble and so there's a lot of this area because this is where tectonic plates are butting up against each other there's a lot of this mountainous region um where water is going to be a huge deal. And we will see that theme kind of pop up. Okay. So uh, this is, oh, that's actually interesting. Here's a map of what they think, where they went down. And then, um, so this is where they were. And so the thought is that the group is going back up a little closer to where like the Nile Delta is right here. And then they're gonna like dip down into the Sinai Peninsula. But you can very much see how um, not desert in Saharan sense, but desert as in 
if you can't wilder wilderness is kind of being different because yes there is some plant life there will be animals but um if you can see in this area setting up a kind of settlement will not be successful so there's not, not a lot of people that live in that area and the people who do tend to be small bands um not great cities but like small groups of people that move around a lot because you have to so it's part of Egypt, but it's not the Sinai. It's not the Sinai Peninsula yet. Yeah. So Egypt's power and control extends pretty far in this time. So yeah. there's, I mean, you have to kind of throw out your idea of national borders. National borders do not exist in this world. Um, yeah. And so this area would still be under Egypt's influence. Mm -hmm. that if Egyptians rolled up, people are going to be like, oh yeah, I have to pay tribute to you versus when you get up a little like crossover and go up a little farther north, you will have to pay tribute to a different power. And then there's the edge where you're kind of in the flux zone. So this is still considered Egypt's territory, more mm -hmm. or less, held by force and not by allegiance. Thanks. All right. So they're, um, so they're butting up against this area where water is going to be of a ve a very big importance. And so when they're moving up a little, or what we would see is up towards the Nile, it looks like, oh no, we ran into the desert and we ran out of supplies. We need to like go get water is essentially what it looks like they are doing. And so by this, this is when you can kind of see Pharaoh's logic going, wait, they look underprepared. Oh, they're probably tired. Oh, they don't have resources to su sustain themselves. We can go snag them back. That was cute, but we, we can grab you. We can force you back. Um, but here's where we do see kind of the interpretation of God's actions saying, I'm doing this so I can gain glory over the Egyptians. The 10th plague wasn't enough. This is like the final blow that I am going to be, I, I'm going to gain glory for this. And that, that seems to be the thing that you all are kind of bucking up against of, it's not good enough to just leave. Like this is now over and above what was necessary. Mm -hmm. All right. So then verse five, this is where we shift perspective. When the king of Egypt's, was told that the people had fled in the minds of Pharaoh and the officials were changed towards the people. And this that is where you see it, Pharaoh yeah. seemingly change his own mind and say, why did we let those people go? Wait, hold on, go get them. <laughs> and this is where we start to see the two stories maybe being stitched together fairly well. In the first one, God's saying, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's going to come after you. But here, Pharaoh's doing it all by himself, saying, hey, let's go snatch those people again. And so he has his chariots made up, uh, 600, or what is that? Yeah, 600 choice chariots and some other people riding because chariots are really fast and people are slow. Um. And so we get the jump back of the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and the king of Egypt pursued the Israelites who were going out boldly. And the Egyptians pursued them. One of the other things that seems to be the cue that we are switching between sources is the difference between calling uh, the leader, the king of Egypt versus Pharaoh. Uh -huh. Those are two language choices, which is one another cue that sources are being stitched. Anyway, so they are, Pharaoh and his armies are now approaching, whether it's by God's will or Pharaoh's own stubbornness. Pharaoh and 600 chariots are approaching. And so what we get next is the people of Israel kind of turning around and seeing the approaching army, not just foot soldiers, but horses. W what do you think of their reaction when they're like, oh no, why did you do this? <laughs> their reaction isn't, oh no, Pharaoh's a jerk, look at him. 
but their reaction is towards Moses saying, were there not enough graves in Egypt? Why did you bring us out here? So what do you think of this response? Well, God is going to make it right as far as the writers of the story are concerned. So mm -hmm. this is the way, this is the indication that it's now going to be God that is going to save them. And mm -hmm. it's convincing the Israelites that this is true. So, yeah, Mary, Mary Ellen. Ellen. Oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Helen. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, they didn't have much faith either. And are we today in a way the same in that sometimes we see something that we think, oh, it cannot ever be solved. And somehow or other, it gets solved. But do we trust God that he will see to things the way it ought to be? Or do we, are we like the Israelites and say, oh, wait a minute. I know he did this before, but is he, how, how can he do this now? So I guess, I guess I sort of see their point, but I think we all do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, Mary Ellen? Well, this part of the story leads me to um, side on the fact of this is more fiction than reality, um, that the story writers um, embellished a whole lot here because you've got 600 chariots, you don't get that organized in a day. You don't get that organized in a week. Mm -hmm. um, you've got, we read before, up to 2 million people on the move. And that does not happen easily. And, you know, there's a lot of stopping along the way. And it's a slow moving thing. And to have the masses of people that they're talking about in this story, um, the story gives the image of this is happening um, quite sequentially, you know, with um, speed and I don't, I don't know what else to put with it. But logistically, this is this is impossible. And so I'm, I am siding on the fact that the story writers um, needed to point, and they conjured this up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, they, the story gives no concept of time mm -hmm. at all. Uh, and they, all of these stories have very definite numbers without any explanation at all of how they got there, how long it took you know, and so forth. It's just, well, there they were. Pharaoh says, give me my 600 chariots, and now here they are on the uh, off chasing the Israel. Well, <laughs> was it a week later, a month later, two months later? Uh, you know, how long was it? How, uh, what time? It's, it's what they're saying is, is, is and what it implies uh without being logically explainable <laughs> that's important to the writers and i gather to us you know so if if we're not tying this to like needing it to be historically a hundred percent or if we don't need to tie it to history we're going to say it that way what is this talk like what is what is the point like what are they getting at and I think that's more in the realm of the question Helen is saying it was, or kind of what you were getting at is like, what does this say about the human experience? If like, these are the people who saw plague after plague after plague, they were saved from the last plague, they exited, and then all of a sudden, immediately, they're like, oh, no, we're gonna die oh no, why did you bring us out here? It's like so quickly they turn around and be like, was this all for nothing? So is that human? Is Yeah, Mary Ellen? I was just going to say to answer, you know, the question you got going is they weren't totally committed to God and um, his 
power and leadership, even after all the plagues, um, the minute there was a possible ensuing crisis, they were ready to go back. They were ready to fear. They were the Egyptians. They were ready to accept the power of the Egyptians versus the power of God. And um, go ahead. Oh, no, well. To that, Chris. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. What you saw was a thought in my head is um, some people talk about marriages as a marriage of convenience, like people married each other because like, well, that was the person that was around at the time. And well, I guess you're good enough. And this it, what was occurring to me is like, is this a God of convenience that will be with you when you're like fighting for us and like on our side? But the moment that adversity comes up, are they like falling away just because um they're, they're just fine. gonna be allegiant to the power at the time so yeah committed and they need to have kind of a big experience from god to bring them back into the fold um so yeah go ahead no that was all i had okay so this is a new pattern that we're going to see set up is like, how do the pe these people, God's chosen people, how do they respond when things get hard? And the question I'm going to be asking a lot is, is it justified? Is, is their fear justified? Is it one of those that you're like, there's a certain point where we bump up against human nature that you can say, be not afraid, but at a certain point, humans are skittish animals and we are going to be afraid and uh, there's a certain point where like uh i actually appreciate the question about the wilderness and like kind of what setting are we going into because it's important to know where they are going and the struggles that they are going to face and is is it actually dangerous or are the people overreacting and this is one where even after all god has done back in egypt there'd be a point where i think it would be very hard not to see a bunch of war chariots going towards you and go oh no that's not good <laughs> i think you're gonna find it really hard to find someone who doesn't innately panic even if god is on your side being like how is this going to work it's it's uh it, it could be identified as a matter of trust if you really trust in God, you wouldn't be scared. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's realistic in terms of human nature, but mm -hmm. which is kind of what you're saying. Of course, it's scary to see all those chariots coming after you. Mm -hmm. I do think the, the thing that makes some, or like where the reactions could be different is the people are rightly scared i think that you're never gonna not be scared with a bunch of war machines going towards you but their reaction was why did you take us out our life was better before like oh, they yeah. almost so immediately forget how terrible life was it well, wasn't moses uh, 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 how are we going to face this moses what is god going to do it's moses you're an awful person <laughs> And I think that is also something that is fascinating to me is we do this so much today as well of looking back in the past with rose colored glasses, forgetting how tumultuous things have been throughout history of seeing change today. And instead of being like, how can we tackle this issue being like, things were better before, why did we change things at all? Like, tackling things with a forward mindset instead of a, a backwards facing mindset. And so this is a moment though, it seems like Moses is going to stand firm. We've kind of seen him develop into this leader uh -huh. Uh -huh. where he is willing to lead now. And now mm -hmm. he says, do not be afraid, stand for, firm and see the deliverance of the Lord that the Lord will accomplish for you today. The, for the Egyptians that you see, shall you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. All you have to do is stand still. Hmm. What do you hear in that? Like, what, what do you hear in this, like, 
very bold acclam or proclamation of Moses. Don't fear. God will do everything. You just have to stand still. It's kind of, it's he, didn't lose, he didn't lose faith. Yeah. What about I, I can say, you know, trust in God and I, I mean, it's work like hell, you know, it's the mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they standing still is puzzling. I'm not sure what why they use that phrase. To do nothing is seems a little too I mean, you can trust in God and get yourself organized. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Well, during World War Two, a big uh, point was made is God is on our side. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mary Ellen. <clears throat> um, I'm finding it interesting. I mean, this is where pacifism comes from in some some respects. So I'll just throw that in there. Um, but Moses is speaking without prompting from the Lord. That um, up through the plagues, God spoke through Aaron to Moses. Um, you know, Moses needed prompting in order to speak to the people. And now we have Moses leading. Mm hmm um, so I find that interesting. So just raise those points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is where, in the time we have left, I'm going to try to break apart some of the, or this is where we see sources stitched together. And we're going to, the question is, are the people standing still or are they moving? All right. So from this proclam bold proclamation, Moses being a leader and saying, God's going to fight for us. Don't worry. Just stand still. The next one in the next verse, we, I mean, kind of Sue, like you were saying, God is on our side, but like, get your act together. <laughs> the Lord says to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. Um, lift up your your staff, stretch your hand out over the sea, divide it so that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. And this is we get a repetition of I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's going to follow you in. I'm going to grab glory. So this is tradition number one. Moses, you have to act now. You have the power, Moses. Raise your hand. The sea will part. The people need to move. And this is, it, there's like a get up and go. Don't look to me. This is a time for action kind of a thing. Cut scene. Next okay. one. The angel of God who was going before the Israelites moved and went behind them. A pillar of cloud moved in front of them and took its place behind them. And it came between the armies of Egypt and the army of the Israelites, so that the cloud was there with the darkness and lit it, and it lit up the night, and one did not come near the other all night. So the question is, are they standing still or are they moving? Well, I thought they were standing still because they had to wait for God to get the waters parted. And oh, that all right. happened overnight. Uh -huh. You know, so the the previous few sentences, the Egyptian chariots are thundering down upon the Israelites. Now, all of a sudden, nobody's going to do anything overnight, you know, and it's mm -hmm. because. Uh, okay, yeah. I, I, so this... I just thought the clouds were giving them cover to move out. They had the light and the, mm -hmm. and the Egyptians couldn't move. So now they could separate themselves and move toward mm -hmm. the, the sea. So this is one where it's interesting because you, it makes sense. Like the, um, for reasons I can't go into now, they do think these are two separate traditions, but they make sense together, which is why it's kind of sneaky. 
Um, there are some like language choices, which is why they think they're separate, but that's a scholarly debate. But yeah, we have this really cool cinematic thing of like the people need time. And so God is almost being a distraction over here and separating them in this pillar of cloud um, that's basically acting. I mean, I, I'm recalling one of the movies where it's basically a tornado between the two armies. Mm -hmm. wow. But it's interesting that in the in the one that's talking about the sea being divided, it's talking about people, families, and the Israelites. And in the other one, they're talking about armies, that God is standing between the Egyptian army and the Israelite army. That never yeah. shows up in the movies. Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and then it cuts so... Um, the cloud is keeping them separated, cuts back to Moses. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind and turned the sea into dry land. And that's where we get this infamous, the, the sea is being pushed back, and the Israelites walk and walk on dry land. That the, the way is being made where there is no way. The waters fall, forming a wall on their right and on their left. And this is the interesting thing. So God is now acting, pushing the waters back. Evidently, the pillar of cloud is not in action right now because the Egyptians are now able to follow them into the sea. Um, Pharaoh's horses and chariots and drivers. Um, and this is where, like, it kind of gets, a, like, when you're going verse by verse, it gets a little fuzzy. At the morning, uh, at the morning watch, the Lord in a pillar of fire and cloud looked upon the Egyptian armies and threw the armies into a panic. So it seems like in, for a verse or two, there's no cloud or pillar because they're able just to follow the Israelites into the sea. And now, once again, there is a <laughs> pillar of both cloud and fire that we've already seen last week, because last week, this is what was leading them through the wilderness was the pillar of cloud and fire. So now it's throwing them into a panic. The chariot wheels are being clogged. Oh. They're not, what? Oh, I was going to say, God is still meddling here. He's not only parting the sea, he's putting mud in the Egyptian chariot wheels, you know. So he's still manipulating this whole crossing. Yep. And the Egyptians' reaction is, let us flee. Looks like God's still fighting for them. Yeah. Right. But that's the first indication that now the Egyptians are accepting the power of the Israelite, Israelite God because mm -hmm. they're going to give up now. Yeah. But it's too late. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so... The Lord says to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians and upon their chariots and chariot drivers. And so Moses once again stretches out his arms. Uh, the Lord uh, and the sea returns to its normal depths. And as the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. So, um, which is something that caught me odd this time it wasn't just that the sea came back it feels like god's like flinging them back into the water not sure what that's supposed to be but um they wanted to make sure they died i guess yeah yeah why couldn't god have let the egyptians escape back home you know retreat you know why mm -hmm. did he why did he have to kill them all off <clears throat> right and so um because it says here, not a one of them remained. Um, and thus, the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. Yada, yada, yada. God saved the day in the end. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the now that we've kind of walked through this story we've seen god be very strong kind of 
taking out vengeance and anger in a way what kind of pops out to you all now like what what do you hear as someone who wants god to be on our side because what the question to me is like today when we pray are we wanting to be the kind of version of the story of stand still and god's gonna act just be there and God is going to be the cloud of pillar and fire and going to do all the work? Or are do we believe in a faith that it's like, no, don't just stand still. You have to get up and run. Like, I can do stuff, but like, you have to be a part of it too. I, I, I think there is a handing over of um, power, at least divided power, that Moses is going to take more leadership and and the uh, people are expected to not stand still. But it's it's gradual, I guess. I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I, yeah. It's like the lilies of the field. I always thought that was the weirdest thing. What do you mean? Just do nothing and God will provide. Since when has that happened? <laughs> Yeah, right. mm -hmm. You put a seed in the ground. <laughs> well, occasionally it, it helps to stand still. I think of trying to bring someone into the church, maybe someone who is unchurched, and you invite them or you tell them about it or whatever, but they still don't come. Then it's time to let God work in them, I think, and stand still. You do what you can, but I think there are times when you need to be patient and just wait. But it it nothing much happens though until you do something, but not always. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you're raising kids, sometimes they figure it out when you're not even paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, Gary. Well, also prior to being told to stand still, they were terrified. They were just all disorganized. So it's kind of like taking a time out, a quiet, just calm down, stand still, don't be running around. And anyway, that's the way I looked at it. Mm -hmm. Frozen in yeah, uh, take the moment to figure out what, like going at things in panic mode is not going to end well. So like, call, like let, let's get a clear head, get a plan of action and then act. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to God interacting with our world today, it's interesting to me the times where we pray for things and we really want God to be that pillar of fire of like, God, just, just fix this. I don't want to do this. I want you to do this. Answer this prayer in a way that I just, you're, you're going to answer it. And I just know you're going to answer it versus the times where we pray and the feeling in the end is, I have to be the answer to this prayer. That to make this prayer a reality, I'm going to have to do the work. Or I'm answering someone else's prayer. Or I have to do the work for this. Um, that if I do nothing, this prayer is not going to get answered. Does that mean you don't have faith? Yeah, Mary Ellen. Well, I'm thinking about two different ways people pray. Okay. There are people who say, God did not heal my desperately ill infant. Therefore, God doesn't answer prayers. And I'm not, you know, going to believe in anymore because he didn't do what I wanted him to do without me. And then there are the other people who say, um, you know, give me strength, give me courage, give me wisdom to deal with this. But I'm part of the equation in um, seeing this through, whatever it is. So I'm seeing a contrast between the two ways people pray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I I think about this often when doing the the like long prayer that we the pastoral prayer after um after the sermon and praying for a lot of things and there are big idea things like 
world peace like there's dealing with system systematic issues like making it so that we're not so polarized and as neighbors can talk to each other and all of these things there there's the prayers that are very are the ones you brought out mary ellen they make me think of like very like personal like in regarding to one person's life and then we have prayers for these big things and it feels like the big things are often where we want them just to happen like almost mysteriously if if we could all just one day wake up and not have issues anymore and sometimes i wonder if in those prayers we're kind of instinctually being like god fix this for us because we've gotten ourselves in thick and it's interesting to try to think about what does it mean for those prayers to be answered um i think in a in a similar i mean not dissimilar to what you were saying of god give me strength god help me out with this help me understand versus you didn't do the thing that i wanted which is i call it like the god slot machine you put in a prayer and you crank the wheel and you expect the prayer as you want it to come out but thinking about what does it mean to pray for like big ideas as well it it seems to me that i haven't really thought about this but i'm thinking about it now the if you're praying for world peace or whatever the other part should be help me to do something that would contribute to this mm -hmm. but help us solve you know help us to figure out what we can do to, as your partner whatever you however you want to conceptualize it mm -hmm. you can't just pray for the solution you've got to pray for what you're going to do to try to get it there yeah 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 so i think most prayers have one part stand still and mm -hmm. one part go oh. <laughs> right. yeah. one part god is going to fight for you but another one is you have to move your feet and go where god is directing and sometimes what yeah yeah so a different um a, a whole different pathway in prayer in in my mind okay. um and and just a recent example our weekend uh receptionist her her mother is very very ill and is probably ready to die and she was in tears and having a very hard time on saturday and I, I talked with her. I stood and talked with her for a while. And I said, you know, I'm going to pray for you tonight, but I'm going to pray that God comforts you. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to pray that God gives you enough comfort that you have extra to share. And when I talked to her the next morning, she was perky. She was upbeat. She was ready to tackle the day and go see her mama after work. And I kind of felt like I had a little bit of a role in that mm -hmm. um but we didn't you know i didn't want to pray to not have her mama go um she's elderly she's ill it's probably time but instead i prayed for her and to me that's an entirely different kind of prayer mm -hmm. than trying to be action oriented in some way yeah. You helped her think about it differently, it sounds like. It was able to, to reframe how she was experiencing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, any final thoughts for today as we wrap up? I hope we're on the other side, on the other shore. <laughs> <laughs> we are on the other side but um that means we are into the wilderness at this point which will be repetitive in its own way 
<laughs> so just looking a little bit ahead, um, this or so yeah, this is the end of the Egypt saga. This was the last and final act. That doesn't mean they're the people are gonna stop talking about Egypt, but Pharaoh and Egypt, they are all out of the picture at this point. So it, we've kind of talked about like story arcs and story loops. In some ways, this completes the full J or I guess it's not Jacob. Um, Joseph. Joseph's story is complete because now his bones are out of Egypt and Egypt's not going to reclaim them. So we are out of Egypt. We are now into the second half of Exodus. The second half of Exodus is different. Uh, to give you a look ahead of what to expect, there are going to be stories interspliced with the beginning of the legal code. So we think of Leviticus being the the part of the Bible that has all the laws and the rules. Not exactly true. That actually begins in Exodus. So we're going to get uh, some more episodic stories and we're going to start getting some rules, some laws. Um, and we we're going to start talking about what does the legal code mean and how do we understand this? Because the Christian understanding of the legal code is not the same as the Jewish understanding of the legal code, and it wouldn't be the ancient understanding of the legal code. So mm -hmm. get ready because we, um, let's see, I don't even think we're actually technically halfway through the story. No, because there's 40 chapters. We're about at 15 and things are going to change pace. So this is where if we get tired of the legal code part of it, we can start moving faster or we can just tap out and say, we're, we're good. I think we understand this. Um, I'm going to be putting out a fall schedule for our like when we're meeting. And I just this is the point where check it. I'm going to try to check in and see how we're doing from this point forward with some of the stories. So episodic stories, we're going to get to the legal code and then. Um, I doubt by the time we're done with Exodus, we'll want to continue in Leviticus, but we can decide from there. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, uh. With that, can I pray us out for today? Oh, Sue, did you have a question? Oh, uh, <laughs> I was, I was, it, it isn't related to this. It has to do with whether or not Matthew 25 is meeting tomorrow. It is contradictory. Um, it says, one place it says we are, another place it doesn't say. So are we starting tomorrow? Oh, I was planning on it, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, all right, just want to make sure. It's not in the calendar. Okay, oops. Which, what, which one is this? The Wednesday book group. This is braiding sweet grass? Yeah. All right, we're starting tomorrow? Yeah. Oh, okay. or if, if I, I'll send an email out about that. If people, or if there's confusion, we can push it back a week. But okay. my apologies. All right, let us pray though. Okay. <laughs> Gracious God, you, we come to you today always hoping that you are on our side and will fight for us. What that looks like, God, we are not always sure. For God, we don't ask you to take vengeance on the people we don't like. We don't ask that we always be in the right, but that you be the constant pillar in our lives that shows us the way forward. Sometimes, God, you ask us to do nothing but stand still and wait for you. And in that silence and in that waiting, sometimes we get anxious and want to move faster than you. And you ask us to simply be and to wait. There are times, God, where you ask us to get up and go and move fast. And sometimes we're tired and we don't want to move fast or we think we've done our job. And so we ask for the courage and the endurance to help us to get up and go in those times. And sometimes, God, our prayers to you are neither. They're prayers that you may be with us, that you may comfort us, that we may know your presence and know that that is enough, that no matter what journey and what path we decide to take, that you remain with us no matter what. 
So be with us in all these forms, God. Be the light that shines ahead and calls us on to you always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you Bye -bye. all next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.